China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi visits Seoul to set the stage for President Xi Jinping's visit to South Korea, expected later this year. Korea's number two web portal Taum and the country's top messaging application Kakao announced their merger plans on the path to creating an IT company worth over 3 trillion won. And the Thai coup leader warns protesters to take heed, saying he's won the royal stamp of approval. Hello and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Tae-ri. Thanks for joining us tonight. We begin with the latest in Korea-China relations. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and his visiting Chinese counterpart Wang Yi have reaffirmed their joint commitment to prevent another nuclear test by North Korea. They both say dialogue is key to resolving issues with Pyongyang, but only if it promises actual progress towards denuclearization. Hwang Sung-yi reports on their common stance towards the North. Amid renewed threats of a fourth nuclear test, South Korea and China said a nuclear-armed North Korea will not be tolerated. Following two hours of talks in Seoul on Monday, South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi agreed on the need to resume dialogue with Pyongyang. This for tangible progress in North Korea's denuclearization and to prevent further development of its nuclear capacity. Yoon said Monday's talks will send a clear message to Pyongyang. I believe Minister Wang's visit will be an opportunity to reaffirm our shared views on intolerance on North Korea's nuclear program and peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and to send a clear message to the North. China, North Korea's closest ally, has called for a swift resumption of the long-stalled six-party denuclearization talks involving the two Koreas, China, the United States, Japan and Russia. But Beijing is growing more frustrated with Pyongyang as it continues to issue threats and launch provocations. The visiting Chinese diplomat expressed hopes to work even more closely with South Korea. China would like to choose South Korea as a more intimate cooperative partner in response to serious changes in regional and international circumstances. The two sides also discussed details of Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to South Korea, which may take place as early as next month. Wang also met with President Park Geun-hye to offer his condolences over the tragic Seoro ferry sinking. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And for more on this, uh, Mr. Chung gi -yung from the Center for International Area Studies at Hangok University of Foreign Studies is joining us in the studio. Welcome to our studio. Nice uh, to be here. This visit by uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi is mainly to set the stage for Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul um, later this year. Some say it's going to be happening at the end of next month. What are you expecting out of that summit? Well, actually, there is a possibility for Seoul to suggest, well, the, an earlier than expected visit by President Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. and the agendas will be fixed, well, during uh, Minister Wang's visit this this time. Mm -hmm. But uh, while well, their main focus would be about North Korean nuclear issues and uh, possible power distribution things and FTA things around, well, Ch between China and Korea. Well, given Japan's recent moves to increase its militarization, um, how do these talks um, at this time send a message to Tokyo? Well, I don't say quite sure for that, but uh, one thing I can well add to this question is that we should remember Wang Yi is known for an expert in Japanese affairs. And well, actually, he had been the Chinese ambassador to Japan from 2004 to 2007, and he contributed a lot to ameliorating the frozen relationships between China and Japan when Japanese ex Prime Minister Koizumi visited Yasukuni Wa Shrine. So we should think of why President Xi Jinping appointed an expert in Japanese affairs to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Okay, and what 
else do you think is on his agenda this time around? Of course, Beijing's uh, message to Pyongyang is another factor to watch. Mm -hmm. So you mean the possible agendas? Right, regarding North Korea. Regarding North Korea. Well, the first thing is that, well, it would be possible for Beijing to well, suggest the restart of six-party talks. Well, and uh, uh, we can expect what Beijing would say about Pyongyang by reviewing what Wang Yi said at a press conference held in March in China. Mm. In front of almost a thousand well, journalists, Wang Yi expressed clearly China's basic attitude toward the Korean Peninsula by using the expression China's red line. And mm. China's red line is that they will not allow any war or disputes on the Korean Peninsula. And Minister Wang Yi added three more basic principles. Number one, denuclearization. Number two, increase the confidence building measures between the two Koreas. Number three, dialogue would be the only method for solving the pending issues. So China and Korea would express again that they will not allow any nuclear weapons in North Korea and, uh, well, uh, and possible well, nuclear test. Can we understand it as, you know, the Xi Jinping administration is different from other Chinese um, previous administrations in terms of dealing with North Korea because China is sort of growing more frustrated with its position of uh, being in a difficult position because of North Korea. After the inauguration of Xi Jinping government, well, Xi Jinping never visited North Korea and uh, well, there had been no summit talks between China and North Korea. So this might give a strong message to North Korea because Xi Jinping decided to visit South Korea prior to his visit to North Korea. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for having me. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chedi from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime News, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. Korea's number one mobile messenger service provider, Kakao, and the country's number two web portal, Taum, have announced their merger plans. This will be the largest merger involving Internet-based companies here in Korea, and analysts say this could pose a threat to Korea's biggest search engine neighbor. Kim ji tells us more. Korea's largest mobile messaging service, Kakao Corporation, has agreed to merge with internet company Town Communications Corporation. When the deal is complete, Kakao will have more than 60% of the equity in the merged company dubbed Town Kakao and will be valued up to 3.9 billion U.S. dollars. The heads of the two companies expect the deal to create a synergy effect as they compete with the country's largest internet portal, Naver Corporation, and its mobile messaging service line. Taum CEO Choi Seun said Kakao's strong competitiveness in the mobile sector, combined with Taum's contents, will help the company compete in the fast-changing market. But some analysts are skeptical that the marriage will help the company enter the global market. Kakao is seeking ways to enter the global market just like Naver did through its line service to survive the competition. With this in mind, Kakao is wasting its time and resources through this merger with Taum, which is a local market-driven company. The unlisted Kakao, which has more than 130 million users, is estimated to be worth $2.3 billion. Town, which is currently listed on the tech heavy cost stack, is valued at more than $1 billion. Kim ji Arirang News. Longer lifespans coupled with a frozen retirement age have Koreans spending less on a day-to-day -day basis than they did 10 years ago, all to make sure that they have enough saved up for the golden years. A survey by the Korea Development Institute shows that the average spending index dropped for all age groups in the 10-year span ending in 2013. But in particular, those reaching retirement age were the most likely to skimp on their daily expenditures as they 
plan for life post-retirement. The institute says the government should come up with measures to extend the retirement age and also reduce the cost of private education as it takes up a large chunk of household expenditures for families with school-aged children. The news last week that uh, President Park Geun-hye accepted the resignations of our presidential security advisors, advisor as well as the country's intelligence chief caught a lot of political observers off guard. However, given the ever-present threat posed by North Korea, the president is expected to waste little time in selecting their replacements. Choi Yoo-sun reports. The question on many people's minds is whether both posts will be filled by those from a military background. Both former security advisor Kim Jang-soo and former head of the National Intelligence Service Nam Jae-jun came from the military, both having served as the Army Chief of Staff. Despite the view of some pundits that the hardline stances of the military-dominant security chiefs have further strained inter-Korean ties, the speculation is that President Park will tap the military ranks again for her new security advisor. This amid North Korea's continued military and nuclear threat in the region. Defense Minister Kim Kwan jin is one of the names reportedly under consideration. As for the next NIS chief, someone from the diplomatic or judicial community who has experience with the spy agency could be nominated. Possible candidates include former spy agency deputy director and current ambassador to Japan Lee byung and former prosecutor and current ambassador to China Kwon young se Both Lee and Kwon were close aides to the president during the 2007 and 2012 presidential elections. However, the announcements could be delayed as both the ruling and opposition sides have raised concerns. President Park's recent nominations for key posts centered too much around figures from the judicial community and Korea's southeastern region. With their approval ratings rising after a recent apology over the ferry disaster and the local elections just a little more than a week away, the pending appointments come at a crucial point. There's also speculation that a reshuffle within the presidential office could occur as early as this week. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. And speaking of a changing of the guard, President Park's prime minister nominee, An Dae-hee, has pledged to give back to society about one million U.S. dollars he earned as a lawyer. At a press conference on Monday, amid controversy over a big jump in earnings, he uh, and alleged privilege he gained from his previous post as a Supreme Court justice. The nominee said he was sorry and that he also thinks getting $1 million in a period of one year is too much. He said that he decided to return the money because he believes his income shouldn't get in the way of fulfilling his promise to set social discipline and eradicate corruption as the next prime minister, adding that he would reform himself first. An's nomination will be confirmed following a parliamentary hearing. With just nine days to go until local elections here in Korea, more and more voters appear to be turning their backs on Korea's two biggest political parties and towards independent candidates. Ji Myung-gil shows us how much influence these voters will have come June 4th. The closer we draw to election day, the more apparent it becomes that voters are leaning toward independent candidates, especially in the city of Busan, a conservative stronghold, and Gwangju, the traditional home ground of liberals. Of all voters on election day, nearly 44 percent are undecided about who they will vote for, according to a survey conducted by Embrain. And of that total, more than half of the respondents said they will vote for independent candidates. This holds extra meaning in the cities of Busan and Gwangju. In the ruling Saenuri Party's home turf of Busan, polls show independent candidate Oh go Don up by nearly four percentage points over the ruling party's Ho byung Su in the race for the mayor. Oh's popularity saw a boost after a candidacy merger on May 16th with Kim Young-chun of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy in an effort to unite liberal votes. Over in the race for mayor of Gwangju, right in the middle of the main opposition's home ground, the liberal candidate Yoon Jang-hyun finds himself trailing behind independent candidate Kang eun tae The polls show that Kang's polling numbers are double those of Yoon's. Kang withdrew from the main opposition party to run as an independent in protest of party's co-leader An Cheol-soo's influence in the nomination of Yoon. 
According to the National Election Commission on Monday, some 2.4 million more people will be able to vote in these local elections, up 6.3 percent from the last ones in 2010. The increase was attributed to the aging and growth of Korea's overall population. Kim young gil Arirang News. Twelve years ago, Buddhist temples in Korea began inviting foreigners and visitors in to give them the sense of what it's like to live as a monk or nun. Well, today, the Temple Stay program continues to offer a diverse set of meditation and cultural programs. But as our Park ji reports, it's getting a new vibe to meet the changing needs of society. Since the Temple Stay program was first introduced in 2002, it's become one of Korea's most representative cultural programs, especially for foreign tourists who want a unique experience during their time here. With the popularity of the program rising, the number of people participating in the Temple Stay program has increased about seven times over during the past 12 years. And to meet the new demands of people living in this ever-changing society, the Joge Order, the largest Buddhism sect in Korea, has revamped its temple stay program. A total of 13 pilot temples around the country will launch the new program starting next month. They will focus on tapping into four themes, consolation, health, emptiness, and vision, and are composed of diverse new routines from walking meditation under the moon and music therapy to mountain climbing and yoga, each according to its theme. However, other key routines that have been staples of the Temple Stay program, like Zen meditation, eating the meals a monk might, and tea ceremonies will remain unchanged. Temple Stay program started when Korean hosted the World Cup in 2002. Many people have found comfort and happiness at temples. We are now trying to make the program more systematic based on the four new themes. The Joge Order has also launched a new line of stationary products inspired by the hundreds of traditional Korean patterns found on temples. Park ji Arirang News. Thailand's monarchy has officially endorsed the country's military to run the country after it staged a coup d'etat last week. With more on that story, we turn to Paul Yi standing by at the News Center. Paul, the Thai military is tightening its grip on the country, banning political gatherings and censoring the media. But will this royal blessing have any real impact in bringing about peace? Well, despite relinquishing much of his powers in the 1930s, the Thai king still holds considerable influence over public opinion, where the monarchy remains the most important institution. However, it's still unclear if this endorsement will be enough to quell a possible uprising and backlash from protest groups. Thai Army Chief Prayut Chan Ochan announced on Monday that the king appointed him the head of a military council to run the country, which he claims legitimizes last week's military coup. Speaking to reporters in the capital of Bangkok, Prayut said he intends to hold elections as soon as possible, but gave no time frame for a vote. He also added that the army would have no choice but to use force if protests flared up again. We will maintain firm control and deal with those who violate the law or use weapons, as well as any protest or anything that will create a restive situation. Soon after the announcement, the Thai general released 13 anti-government protest leaders who have been indicted with treason and other criminal charges. Scores of politicians, activists and academics have also been taken into custody. The military overthrew the government last Thursday after months of debilitating and at times violent clashes between the populist government and former Prime Minister Ying Lakshinawat and anti-establishment groups. And turning now to elections in Ukraine, exit polls show that the billionaire tycoon Petro Poshavenko is set to become the country's next president. He made his fortune in the confectionery industry, which earned him the nickname Chocolate King. His business empire also includes several automakers, a shipyard, and even a TV channel. But Poroshenko isn't new to politics. He served in the cabinet of ousted President Viktor Yanukovych and the administration before that. Kiev's election commission said exit polls gave Poroshenko nearly 56 percent of the vote, enough for him to bypass a second runoff. 
If confirmed, the 48-year-old candy magnate faces the challenge of pulling back the country from the brink of bankruptcy following six months of political turmoil. The first steps which our entire team will take from the start of the presidency will be focused on ending the war, chaos and disorder, and bringing peace to the land for a united and integral Ukraine. The early election results also come as a dozen armed pro-Russian separatists force a shutdown of a major airport in the eastern city of Donetsk. Officials say shots were fired and there was a confrontation. However, there are no reports of any wounded. The group has not made any demands except for the withdrawal of security personnel. And over in Japan, one of the country's most popular female pop groups, AKB48, has been attacked in the northeastern city of Takazawa. Two of the group's members, Rina Kawaii and Anna Iriyama, were shaking hands with fans at an event on Sunday when they were suddenly slashed by a man wielding a saw measuring half a meter long. Japanese media say that two young women received emergency surgery after suffering cuts to the face and broken fingers. A male staff member also re received cuts to his hands. However, the group's manager said they were all in stable condition. They'll be discharged from the hospital tomorrow. The time is unconfirmed. After the incident, police arrested a 24-year-old high school dropout for attempted murder. The group's management company has canceled the concert in Tokyo and all other meet-and-greet events. AKB48 was founded in 2005 and has since grown into the world's biggest group of its kind, with some 240 members, according to Guinness World Records. That wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. South Korea's port city of Incheon is playing host to many, many events uh, this year, including the World Wheelchair Basketball Championships. And as a precursor to the Incheon Para Asian Games in October, which is in itself a part of the larger Asian Games, the Wheelchair Worlds are considered one of the biggest draws in para sports. It runs for 10 days starting July 5th. And moving on to golf, first in the PGA, newly minted world number one Adam Scott won at Colonial to prove that he belongs at the top. He ended the final round tied with Jason Duffner at nine under par, sending it to a three-hole playoff, which he won on the final hole to lift the Crown Plaza Invitational Trophy. Meanwhile, on the Euro Tour, Roy McIlroy bounced back from an emotionally draining week to win the BMW PGA Championship at Wentworth. And over on the ladies' side, the Airbus LPGA Classic came to a close with American Jessica Corda winning on home turf. The 21-year-old Florida native surged on the back nine of the final round with six birdies, overtaking third-round leader Anna Norkvist by a stroke and finishing at 20 under par. Meanwhile, world number one Pagenby missed the cut after round two, but will keep her top rank for the 59th week in a row. And shifting gears to Formula One, Team Mercedes put out its sixth winning car in a row this season, and this time it was Nico Rosberg who came out on top. Teammate Lewis Hamilton had four straight wins coming in, but Rosberg was able to hold him off at second place after starting the race in pole position. And with his second win of the season, Rosberg has taken a slim four-point lead over Hamilton on the championship standings. And finish on, finishing off, let's come back home for a look at the latest KBO standings. And on top are these Hamsung Lions who are on a tear, having won the last 11 of 12 games with one tie. They've only lost five games since late last month. Tucson now sits at second place, also having made their way up the ladder, while NC and Nexon drop to third and fourth. And looking down the order, Lotte is at fifth after losing the last two series. SK stands four games behind 500 as they try to figure it all out. Meanwhile, Kia, Hanwha, and LG occupy the bottom of the order. And that's all I have for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you back here later for more from the world of sports. It was a sunny day here in Korea, but toxic fine dust from China made an unwelcomed visit.
Exactly. For more, we connect live to our Kim Bogyang at the Weather Center. So, Bogyang, let's uh, start with uh, start off with the fine dust level. Guys, fine dust readings will remain high, mostly in the central regions and parts of the southern regions through this evening. At the moment, Seoul is seeing about 98 micrograms per cubic meter fine dust, and levels are even higher in Gosan on Jeju Island, where it's at about 211 micrograms per cubic meter, so those with respiratory problems should take caution when heading outdoors. Now, the nation will gradually be under the influence of a high pressure system from China, which is why we're seeing relatively clear skies across the map. And for those of you getting behind the wheel early tomorrow morning, be extra careful as misty conditions are forecast for some inland regions. Otherwise, tomorrow looks to be a bright and sunny day nationwide with high UV levels. Early summer conditions will continue throughout the week with no rain expected. On to Tuesday's readings, Seoul will start off the day at 16 degrees with a high of 28, while Daegu jumps to 33 and Busan reaches 26. Moving on to other places, Jeju and Mount Kumgang peak in the high 20s, while Dokdo tops out at 21. And that's all the updates for this hour, but I'll be back with more in about two hours. And that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching. Good night, and do join us again tomorrow.